Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this weekly live program. My guest for this evening is Thomas Benton. I learned of Thomas about a year or so ago when a friend of his gave me a copy of his book, Uncle Jeb and the Spirit, which he'll talk a bit later. When, he, when his friend told me about his book, he told me about, a little bit about his journey. And so it's been a while since we've had him scheduled, but he's finally here this evening for this program. Thomas is an attorney in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He's been a convert for what, almost 40 years, is that right? That's right. And so he came into the church before, before Vatican II. That's right. And he'll talk a little bit about <coughs> his journey. His journey is not one of those kind of journeys where it's a one time, it's a, a long journey, which is really more common for most of us because we grow in our spiritual lives in relationship to how the Holy Spirit is working in our hearts. So he'll share that with us in a moment. The theme that Thomas has chosen for our program is the theme of unconditional love. And one of the ways in which he will talk about that and the way he experiences that is both through um, some contact that he's had with Mother Teresa, but also through his work in the pro-life uh, part of the social work of the church. Remember, you're an important part of our program, so be sure you call us your questions and emails. But uh, we look forward to uh, hearing what Tom has to tell us tonight about his journey to the church. Okay. Welcome, <coughs> Thomas. <coughs> well, uh, when you look back 40 years uh, from uh, this particular viewpoint, uh, it, it's really a, a, a sentimental journey to the past. That's right. But as many of the audience who probably lived during that period of time can remember, it was World War II time. It was a time when we knew who evil was. It was okay. Hitler. And we knew who was right. It was us. And it was a time of great stress and a great fear. And I can remember all of that starting at an earlier age because Hitler was a, a power in Europe as early as 1935. I was born in 1930. And in Baton Rouge, that was a small community then. We weren't more than 50 or 60,000 people at that time. And I had a German refugee child in my first grade class in 1936 who became a lifetime friend. Mm -hmm. So we lived with that shadow over us at that time. And, it, and it, I think it affected our religious views, all of us. We just assume that you believe. You assume that you are Christian. You assume that you accepted the things that were there. But the, uh, I was a Methodist. And the Methodist church was founded by John Wesley in the early 1700s. At least he was a, the guiding force. And he was a beautiful man. He was a, a, a beautiful Christian. And, and I, I say it was the, greatest ex, the greatest training in the world for a Catholic pre-Vatican was to have been a Methodist first, you see. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's the position I was in. Well, in any event, at that particular time, the one thing that we did have very clearly set up was the difference between Catholics and Protestants. I mean, we had an iron wall between us. Uh, the Catholics were very defensive with us, and we were very defensive with them, and we tried to keep from having the marriages, but you know, boys and girls kept falling in love. And I was a very anti-Catholic. I was a, a pusher. I think I had converts out of the Catholic Church. <laughs> We'd go there and watch Mass, and there would be a lady counting those beads, and, and uh, people mumbling stuff in Latin during the Mass, and the priest would say, this week there'll be no meat on Friday, you know, and no, no real sermons. And we, and we, we, had to, we survived on sermons, the personality of us. So we, we couldn't understand why you packed the church. You know, it looked so, so dumb, you know. <laughs> the whole thing was incredible to us. And then I, I, I went through the period of uh, when the veterans came back after World War II, and they came back very disillusioned. I mean, you don't see what they see and, and, and don't ask the questions, why, Lord? You know, why did you let this horrible thing happen? Why didn't you do something about it? They were either that way or they were very devout. There were none in between. Mm -hmm. But they were not openly rebellious like the Vietnam ver veterans. They were quiet. They just more or less abdicated religion to their wives. They abdicated the responsibility. It was a, a social mm -hmm. thing and they participated in it. And this affected our, our general, uh, I mean, when I was in college, it affected us. You know, because they were there and I was with them. And these were men that uh, were wounded and, and still some of them with claws and that mm. sort of thing. It was a terrible sort of thing to have to live with. And at that point in my life, uh, from a spiritual standpoint, and I was getting closer to marriage, I began to be very attracted to the idea of having a very large family. I wanted many children. 
And my beautiful Protestant girls didn't have that in mind, but the Catholic girls did. <laughs> <laughs> they expected to be mothers of big families. And, uh, and so I've, the Catholic girls get, began to be much more attractive to me. So they say, what, what attracted you to the Catholic Church? Beautiful Catholic women attracted me to the Catholic Church. <laughs> <laughs> and I finally fell in love with one, or at least I thought I did, and I went into the service, <clears throat> and I decided I wanted to learn something about the Catholic Church, since I was getting fairly serious with this girl. And I ended up in Big Spring, Texas, a little base out there with the Air Force, and my boss was Dakin Williams, uh, Tennessee Williams' brother, mm. who had just become a Catholic, and he was a wild Catholic convert. I didn't realize it. So for him, me to come in and say, will you tell me something about the church? Was, he was just thrilled. <laughs> and he just set up a whole regime. And I met with a base priest. Who, the first thing he did was uh, to talk about uh, the Bible. He, he, he had memorized the, much of the New Testament. I said, so much about Catholics not ever studying the Bible. Here was a priest that was, uh, knew it by heart. And then Dakin had me teach a Catholic layman's Bible class that he was going to leave on because that priest left and then he took over mm. the Bible class and he had me do it. And the local priest was horrified. So he came to hear this Protestant was going to teach the Catholic Bible <laughs> class. But we did it out of a book. I could just take it down to the book. And uh, Father Wagner came and uh, I, I was a good teacher. And as a matter of fact, I learned more from the Bible teaching that Catholic Bible class than I ever did when I was a Methodist. So. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the first melting point. Father Wagner had a, a, a a, uh, a Mexican church, a Spanish church, and I went to his church. And I'll never forget, sitting in that church, the sermon was in Spanish, the Mass was in Latin, and I found out for the first time what was going on in the Mass. <laughs> you believe in the physical presence of Christ in that bread? And then he explained each step. You know, we confess, we try and get our soul straight, and then we have a study from the Bible, and we have a little this, that, and the other. And I don't know why that struck me. I said, that's an incredible thing to believe. You, you really believe that Christ is present in that in that that Eucharist, and then I began to get other other understandings of what the Catholics taught. And you know, when you have a total and complete misconception of somebody or something, you feel terribly guilty when you find out how wrong you are. And I began to have this terrible <laughs> guilt, and, and I even raised money and bought a whole bunch of uh, whole new uh, stations of the cross for that little uh -huh. that little Mexican church. We had. <laughs> We got them because they looked so terrible, and you could get about three or four hundred dollars, and we were able to raise that. And during that time, I was also being exposed to, of course, man's inhumanity to man. I tried about eighty cases, and and uh, they appointed me as a you family were, as counselor. An attorney. Yeah. yeah, as an attorney. I'm an attorney, and uh, and I had to work with chaplains, and I had to work when we had people out, and and the the, the Catholics chaplains were really sharp. They were really sharp, mm. and a poor. Uh, Lutheran pastor I work with seemed to be causing more problems than we. I felt that he was probably a failure in pr civil right in, this, uh, in his private life. But I, I began to get a different view, uh, entirely different from my entire life. Life. And so when I came back from the service and that romance was over, then the next beautiful Catholic girl I married. <laughs> and I think that at that point I had started my confession. I mean my conversion because I was ready to accept this church and I was looking forward to having this big family. Now, among all my friends in school was one that became a priest. And I remember the first time we were about to get married and, and we asked the pastor of her church, you know, well, he said, that's unfortunate you're marrying this Protestant. And he began to, and just really enraged me, you know. So I called my friend, the priest in New Orleans, Cage Garden, Father Cage Garden, and says, are you coming to my wedding? And he, and he said, yes, I'm going to get there. I'll be late. I said, I want you to be there and do the service. <laughs> I said, what? Yeah. He said, well, I can't come until the service. Said, That's good enough. Call up Monsignor Loman. And so when I, we had this big wedding, we had no rehearsal with a priest. We came down the aisle and we knelt down and then Cage came up and introduced himself to my wife, Bootsy. Now, let me stop here and tell you something about my family because it's a big thing. I am, uh, my first wife died when, uh, uh, oh, I guess our oldest child was 14 of uh, breast cancer, and I remarried my best friend's widow. We fell in love, and that's 25 years ago. She had four kids and I had six. So we reared six, uh, 10 kids, uh, and at one time had eight teenagers, because they were all the same age. And we were <laughs> friends up and down the street. So uh, uh, That was a challenge, right? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I want you to know that there are other facets to life that we've had here. <laughs> but uh, in, in any event, uh, that 
experience of getting up from that warm greeting. Well, uh, uh, Cage then greeted us at the altar and talked to us about 10 minutes and told Bootsy what, how close we were and what a fine fellow I was. And, and I got up and I was in a warm, friendly place. Hmm. You know, I wasn't in that cold church I went in there saying, I'm sorry you're here. I was in a warm, friendly place. That was the first real move towards my hmm. becoming a Catholic. Just a little hmm. thing like that. But it was a big thing. Hmm. And so... Uh, we had our first, and incidentally, I, of course, I wasn't worried about birth control. I wanted babies, so we, had, we, had, we weren't <laughs> going to worry. We were going to get on with it. And we had our first child, and, and always Bootsy had terrible things happen to her. She had an infection of the kidney, and, and uh, we went to Oshner, and we had the old doctor who founded uh, the urology clinic, and he told us, he said, you know, if I don't save this kidney, you can't have any more babies. And, and when she was, he was going to operate on her, and I wanted to pray in the worst sort of way, and I went to the Methodist church and the door was locked. And I thought of that red light down at, at the Catholic church and I went out across from, it's in New Orleans, I went out across from the, the Fairmont to the Jesuit church there. And I remember walking through the door and the smell, you know, and, and everything was terrible downtown. <clears throat> Got in there, knelt down before that red light. You know, the, the Catholic church has That's right, the always tells you where now. the Eucharist is by a, a lantern. By a candle, it's yeah, always a red light. And yeah. so I went to where I knew the Eucharist was, and I knelt down. Because I needed a holy place, I, you know, I, I realized that I couldn't go pray on, pray on the corner or downstairs in the lobby. I wanted a holy place. And the Catholics believed this was holy. And at least they believed it was holy. <laughs> and I went there. And when I got up, I was a Catholic. Now, it took me about a year and a half to become a Catholic mm. because I studied. But that's, I got up a Catholic. See? Mm. Now, people say all the theology and everything. Uh, you know, I, I just... I, 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 as I say in my book, our, our faith was not made so difficult that only a few geniuses <laughs> in a given you know, era can understand it. It was made simple enough for the most simple of us. The human heart is set to be able to react and, uh, and to understand. I don't care if you're a mongoloid child or, or, or retarded. I think sometimes the holiest people in a church are going to be the janitor, you know, uh, because it doesn't take that. It takes a pure heart this unconditional love we'd be talking about. And so I thought it was a legitimate experience to suddenly, just as I did with my present wife, Jody, who is absolutely wonderful and a devout Catholic and managed to married me with six children without even thinking that was a bad thing. <laughs> I mean, oh, that was a plus to her. She always wanted a big family herself. And mm -hmm. so she got it <coughs> big time. But uh, just like when I saw her and knew I was in love with her, it just hit me. Bang, you know, <laughs> that was it 25 years ago. I hadn't changed. And I think that's possible. It's very valid. And it was in the case of the church. I studied under Bishop, who's Archbishop uh, Borders, the retired Bishop of Baltimore. Now, he was Monsignor Borders at LSU at the time. And I had my own pastor uh, on one side and him on the other. And, and my own pastor was a very sweet man and a eloquent sermon. He could be, preach eloquent sermons, but he couldn't answer the questions, really. You know, huh. all the Borders blew him away. And... I was baptized and came into the church. But when I did, I told Father Borders, you know, I want to, I have complaints about obstacles placed in my path to conversion that shouldn't have been there. Hmm. And uh, he said, you want to give a talk on it? I said, sure do. And so I gave a talk to one of his groups. And it got to be a very popular talk. I hmm. gave it several times because I was talking about little things like don't say these things to insult Protestants. Explain your sacraments. Explain mm. the Pope. Explain the, the things that are beautiful in the church so they'll understand it and not have this false impression of what you're doing. And it's when you have to go pray that you go to God, which sometimes gives it the impression that God has a vested interest in pain, you know, mm. and, and uh, we, we make all happy things. He makes all sad things. But it isn't. It's the only time we realize that, that God, uh, we need him. So those things happen. But so that these are tur uh, uh, turning points that, that come along in your life that make you think. Mm -hmm. The, the next big point that came to my mind when I thought back, which was my first introduction to uh, unconditional love, was we had this little daughter that I had to take care of because Bootsy was sick. So I became mom and daddy. You know, I took care of it at night, and I, I changed it. And I can remember about five or six weeks leaning against the wall to stay awake, waiting for the most beautiful sound in the world, burp, you know, <laughs> with this uh, little girl and that little fuzzy head on my cheek, and I just adored that baby. And I said, here I am. I can't imagine life without this baby. I love her to death. And I'm getting absolutely no recognition from her at all. She's not saying, gee, that's good, Daddy. Gee, you're a nice fellow. Nobody's giving me awards. And here I am 
having this incredible experience of love. And it hit me. This is what you get with unconditional love. Mm -hmm. I'm experiencing God's grace right now. Mm -hmm. I'm experiencing God's grace. Why? Because I've been doing an unconditional loving act with this little child. Mm -hmm. And it just, it was the first real experience that mm -hmm. I could say was my realization of grace. Now, mm -hmm. I think we have these experiences, but we don't give God experience. Mm -hmm. See, every time we do an unconditional loving act, a really unconditional loving act, we experience God's grace right then. Why? Because He helps us do it. Mm -hmm. We really can't do it without God. You know, we have to line ourselves up to do it. And I don't care what state you're in, you can have that grace if you do this unconditional loving act. So spiritually, that was the first real step, is having this child and, and going forward with it. And uh, uh, of course, after that, I got into enormous work with the church because the Vatican II came along and I was the known Protestant convert, see, because I'd spoken to all these people and the bishop... Uh, appointed me to be on the first ecumenical commission. There were two of us, <laughs> a, a, a black priest, a wonderful man. And he walked into the, I mean, he, he, I'm not going to get off on him. He's such a wonderful fellow. But um, I went into that and then taught kids. And, uh, and, and also, also, education. Done -life also in the first lay Congress, okay. I got a battlefield promotion and ended up cha chairman of the, of the education <laughs> committee. And our bishop was extremely aggressive after Vatican II, much to the consternation of the diocese. But yeah. I was there with him, and I was comfortable. See, I could tell him what tithing was. Let me ask you a couple questions then about your journey. And Thomas, thank you. You've done a wonderful job of condensing 40 years of a journey on how what you've really described well is that conversion is a gift, right? It's a gift of God's grace that touches our hearts. Sometimes we can describe conversion intellectually, doctrines, but sometimes he grabs a person's heart, as you described. A couple of things as you described your journey that, I, that I'm hoping will also touch some that are watching. You mentioned early that coming up in the church and you all just assume that everybody believed. I mean, that's kind of common for many people, isn't it? I mean, people are brought up in the system and maybe not challenged to believe, right? Until later in your own your own journey. Uh, maybe what happened is something, which in your case may have been the holding of that little child, awakened you to see how much deeper. What I wanted that, that baby, that operation to be a success with, with uh, Bootsy is when I first yeah. and I, you know, went to my knees in the most you know, powerful way. And, and sometimes, got that experience, you know. sometimes the Lord has to use two by fours and to get our attention. You know, life is going to be that way. That's right. And <coughs> often, what we receive from God depends on how we respond in that moment. Uh, something else that you had said that, again, I think about others who struggled with the church. Uh, one of the steps in your conversion was that moment when it was a cold environment, but out of the unconditional love given to you through that priest. All of a sudden, it was what? A friendly Absolutely. and warm environment. That's what he did. He pulled the conditions off of me being a Protestant, and he, I became his friend getting married. You know, lifetime friend getting married. And, and that was, that was unconditional love. And it just, it, it, it did, you know, brought, melted that ice that was there. <coughs> Another comment that you made about your journey, which I think some in the audience, uh, you know, of your generation, reflect on uh, that the, the struggles of coming out of World War II and the barriers to faith. You want to comment a little bit more on that? And well, yes. I think that everybody has to come to grips with why does God let this happen? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's probably the biggest stumbling block to any Christianity. Why? Because we get Santa Claus religion. You know, if I'm a good boy, I get what I want at Christmas. Mm -hmm. And then we find out that Santa Claus was kind of a plan from parents. And then we <laughs> say, God, I'm going to be good. God will give me something good. You know? And then it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And you have the wrong, you have the wrong idea. So I, I have. That, that's what I try to do in my, my book, address that as a major issue. Yeah, talk about, how, how did you get started on this book? Well, I was, it, it, it was to, to set down, well, for one thing, nobody reads my briefs now, even. <laughs> as a second. lawyer, you mean? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, certainly not after I'm going to be dead, and I wanted to have something that was kind of a, 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 a you know, a message to my family, and, and it got to be more and more as the years went by. But the idea is, is, uh, is the beauty of unconditional love is this, that, uh, and that's the answer. If you have unconditional love and you can understand that we're given this awesome freedom, this dangerous freedom that we can go out and use and do wonderful new creative things. I and mean, we can create. In other words, when we love, we create the love. Mm -hmm. 
We create my, my, my example of the, we talked about before the program of the garden, uh, where the, the wonderful garden, flowers and vegetables and this old man that's been working on it there and you come by and you ask him, the lady asks him, says, oh, John, isn't it wonderful what God can do? And he said, yes, but you should have seen it when just God had it, you know? <laughs> Well, that's life. You know, God is going to make the seeds, but we got to pull the weeds. Yeah. And when we do those things, I think, you know, he's our father. He's so proud of us. He, 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 we do these young things. I mean, it, that, that book, you know, they're all plagiarized wisdom that's in it. But I did the book, you know. And if I'm a ditch digger, I did the ditch. And if I do it good, he's proud of me. And yeah. he's equally proud of me, you see. Yeah. And so you can have these relationships. If, if I love, it's my love that he let me create and help me with. And then he's going to grow that flower. Mm -hmm. You see, we've got to have the environment to do it. And, and it's such a beautiful thought. And it's consoling mm -hmm. because we live in a life where we're going to die and we're going to suffer and we're going to lose things and we're going to have terrible tragedies. And there's no way it's not going to be that way. Mm -hmm. And if we can't give those things meaning, divine meaning, then we become dead to ourselves. We become afraid to live and sink into it. I'm reminding, I, I forget right now which saint it said. I think maybe it was St. Francis de Sales or either St. Francis Xavier that said, uh, that you work as if it's all your effort and you pray as if it's all God's. And that it touches that mystery of the fact that, uh, like you said, you, you work in the garden and you've got you've to do the, the weeding and the hoeing and the picking, but God sends the, the rain and God sends the, the sun. He gives the roots. Gives the growth. The gives ten, the growth. We have the Ten it's Commandments. A, it's a, not it's the, a partnership. You know. it's, it's a mystery of a partnership. It's a partnership, but, but His rules are there. You have to follow those rules, and the Ten Commandments are not the Ten Suggestions. They are, uh, <laughs> you know, they're, they're like the laws of gravity. A, a thief hates to be robbed, you know. <laughs> Nobody, you know, you take these things and you put them down, and you're not going to succeed if you don't follow them. And I, I can say that we, had the, we can have this ethical principle about life and still not have God. Mm -hmm. We can live and be good people and have this ethical principle, but we're not, we're not going to get this special relationship with our, our, our God. And let me say this, one more thing that I, I, I want to say before I forget it. There's some things that can't be taught by the church mm. or by anybody. And uh, like you can't teach somebody what a rose smells like unless mm. you do what? See? You can't teach somebody what it's like to be touched by the living God. Mm. You can't do that. That has to be experienced. You now, can what describe the, it the best yeah, you can. See, what the judge and what the, the, the Catholic right. Church does so beautifully. Tells you where the rose garden is. Tells you how to get there and how to act when you're on the way and how to act when you get there. The, the sacraments are there for each person individually. But we have a family that we're in. We have a mother and a father and a, and a brother and all these people all over the world of every race that, you know, that's in our big family. And it's a warm feeling. It's a wonderful feeling, you know. And uh, we have our differences and we're full of sinners. As a matter of fact, the whole church is <laughs> full of sinners. But we still have that golden thread that goes back to Jesus. We still have that golden thread that comes down that somehow has, has survived all this time. See? Again, it reminds me of the, if this love that comes from God, God so loved the world he gave, right? It was right. a gift, but it still has to be received. Right. It still has to be received, even in the different steps of your own journey. God touched you at those moments, but you still needed to respond. That's correct. It's a both and. It's like when you said you went to that church to pray for your wife's healing, and uh, you were following the guidance of the Spirit. You wanted to be in a holy place because you wanted to be near God. But when you, when you said you got up, something had changed in your heart. You know what? The logic of Jesus, what Jesus did, just think about it. He made that Eucharist his physical contact with us because we're physical, the human mm -hmm. side. But it's still a mystery. Right. Of the reality of God's presence. That's right. Now, just so they know that it, the book is uh, Uncle Jeb and the Spirit by Thomas Benton. And it's a fiction, right? Right. It's a story. It's and a story. Uh, I, I was embarrassed when you came because I hadn't read it yet. You had given me the book. My wife read it. I gave it to my <laughs> wife to read. She enjoyed it. And we ended up giving it to my father for Christmas. And I've been waiting to get my own copy so I could read it again. So I'm looking forward to finally get my copy. So during the break, you'll see information. If you'd like to find out about Thomas's book. Which is this describe your own journey or is the journey of oh, Uncle yeah. Jeb? Th you're you're kind of worked in there. Yeah, the fictional part of it, you know, the, the diff I tried to ask every hard question I could and then dramatize it in the personalities that were going on. And I got, uh, of course, I got a lot of encouragement. Good encouragement. Scott Hahn's recommendation on yeah. the back. That helps. And, uh, and it, it's, uh, 
If you, as a matter of fact, you've ordered seven copies, you know, That's which you hadn't paid for yet. What? <laughs> <laughs> we can cut that from the day. <laughs> Please stay with us. <laughs> we'll be back in just a minute when I work on my bill here. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest this evening is Thomas Benton, who's an attorney from Baton Rouge, and he's also an author of Uncle Jeb and the Spirit. And we've been talking about his journey and the theme of unconditional love, in other words, how God, through his, the gift of grace, touched his heart, opened his heart to the reality of Jesus Christ in his church, and also how he discovered in his own self how that was a, a reality of true love being an unconditional gift. And before we take your calls, uh, emails, uh, one thing we did mention earlier was the part that Mother Teresa played in your journey. Well, I had uh, a very high point of being a Catholic was working with her. I worked with David and Ann Trufant with the Unwed Mother's Home and others, John Baker and others in Baton Rouge, uh, back, oh, 18, 19 years ago. And we were having trouble keeping it alive, and Ann got the idea we should try and get Mother Teresa. said, why not go to the best? And, and Bishop Ott invited her to come to Baton Rouge, and then she actually was going to meet with us in, in Washington. In the meantime, David and uh, Ann, uh, he, he had taken a picture of her when they were engaged, and I had one of those pictures of Mother Teresa. And I didn't need to go, but I had that picture. And I said, I can get it autographed. So I went, <laughs> and, I went <coughs> and I wanted to, to, to meet with her. And we did. We we got to meet with her at uh, in in uh, uh, Washington, and we were able to get her to come to Baton Rouge. And while she was there, she came in kind of in a rush. Uh, I was I, 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 I introduced her, walked her around, did different things. I, I'm not going to go into all the conversations. And I saw how she worked the crowd, like amazing. You know how she would never. She met everybody. She could see them. She just it penetrated the people that she, she looked at. She was into each person that was there. Mm -hmm. And I said, and she's not running for office either. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, if she came in the room, she smiled, you smiled. There was a presence there that was incredible. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't help but think that here's this little lady, four foot, uh, you know, four, tiny lady, withered and not, you know, beautiful features, and yet she was the most beautiful thing to look at with a smile. And here she had lived, a little peasant girl, and she is individually the, the greatest, uh, I think, religious, spiritual influence of this century. Mm. And to have just been there and present with her, the power of her unconditional loving life mm. always turned out to the people she's dealing with, always. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I guess I have to tell the story about Ann and David because when they first met her, they were engaged and they were standing in a room. Uh, when she came in, there were four of them, and Mother Teresa met all four of them and stood back and pointed at David and Ann and said, when are you two getting married? <laughs> and uh, I mean, just like that. And, and the way we understood it really was that Mother looked at everybody in that room and he saw the beautiful Ann and saw the lovesick David and no ring on her finger and just said, I bet they're getting married. And she did it all in a flash, you know. She was so <laughs> turned out, she just did it in a flash. And, and it's that sort of... Uh, it's that sort of power that came from being with it. It, it, changed, it changes anybody that works with it. It changed me. It made the personification in a human form of unconditional love much more yeah. easy to see and understand and follow. All right, thank you. Let's take our first caller. This is John. Hello, John. What's your question for tonight? Yeah, hi, Marcus. I okay. had a question from uh, your guest, Mr. Benton. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Benton, I was uh, hoping to ask you what practical things can lay Catholic men and women do to encourage our Methodist and other Protestant brothers and sisters to come home to the church? Well, it's going to be difficult. I've been in ecumenism for a long time, and, and uh, you really have to have somebody that's willing to, uh, to study the church. You can't force it on people. 
I mean, it's a mistake to try and force your religion on people. The best thing to do is to be a living example of your faith and to explain your faith mm -hmm. and to make certain they understand. I mean, there are a lot of things that, that, that they just don't understand. And if you can explain Mary, you can explain confession, you can explain the Eucharist, you can explain two or three of these and learn how to do that, then you knock down their prejudice. And then the rest has to come, the rest has to come. You're, talk, you're talking about building relationships, yeah, and uh, and not just uh, hitting them with a hammer with a bunch of doctrines, but loving them. That's right. And, that, and, and you have to be your own faith. You have to, you don't back off. I, I work with uh, in, in the in the pro-life movement. I work with wonderful uh, Protestants. We we are in the trenches, you know, uh, and uh, they joke about me, and I joke about them on the religions. But <laughs> we. Uh, they, they have to see the church, and, and when you get a chance to explain it, you can, but there's a tremendous ignorance there. There's a mm -hmm. tremendous uh, misunderstanding. It, it's very difficult to overcome just in everyday social gatherings. You have to formalize it in an ecumenical gathering where you're going to meet together and let's say, let's talk about this and let's get these things, and then you have to be ready to, to, to do, do your homework and do it right. See. Would uh, your book be a helpful tool? This, this is a book that, that uh, brings you to God and the, and the church. That's right. And it's gets you over that big hunt hurdle. Right. Gets you over it the might big be hurdle. a tool. It doesn't, it, it doesn't get into the theology part other than the holy place for the Mass that All I right. talked about. It's right. there. So it's Good. there. Let's take our first email. This comes from Edna. It says, Hello, as a convert, I was wondering how your guest, Mr. Benton, looked at Mary as a Protestant and how he looks at her now as a Catholic. Thank you. Well, we thought that you prayed to Mary and that you had deified her. And uh, now, of course, uh, I just think she's wonderful. I think she's a, she is the answer to uh, everybody's uh, talking about the greatest feminist that ever lived. Mary was the greatest feminist. She's, <laughs> she, uh, she's the one that brought the softness of femininity into the Catholic Church, a very ma uh, masculine church. Uh, she's the greatest evangelist that ever lived. I mean, she keeps coming back and we say pulling these stunts like Magigorian and, <laughs> and Lourdes and so forth and these miracles and she just converts people. She works, it. I think Christ sends her back I think he sends her back as his, his, uh, his contact to the world. And she is God's mother, and we should honor her, just like the Ten Commandments says as one of the parents. So I, I defend her with great strength uh, with my Protestant friends, and I don't back off at all. And I, I think that she's one of the, you know, the, the strongest points. She's the mother of our family. She is the, the symbol of all, because women are much more intuitive about spiritual matters. Um, the ladies are just much more intuitive than we men. And I think it comes from being, uh, th they create life in their body. They're part of the creative process, but they have, uh, Christ in, in always had strong women around. St. Paul would go in, he got the women first, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> the men were the brickheads, <laughs> the women weren't. <laughs> and uh, it's just, a, and she's just the model for that. She's yeah. the model for any person that, to, to go in. It's just well, wonderful. Yeah. Once again, as you were saying, that, uh, because of the ignorance that people do not understand not what we believe, but they don't understand when they watch us yeah. in a relationship oh, with that's, prayer. That's right. They don't see that. So again, and we're not praying to her. You know, yeah. we, but we also say we com the communion of saints. I said, this is a saint. What's wrong with asking? Uh, you, I asked my friends to pray for me. What's wrong with asking Mary to pray for me? You know, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's There's stupid. bigger issues there. I mean, why can't I go to the top? You know, <laughs> 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 That's right. So again, building relationships with those outside the church so that in the relationships you can talk about That's what the right. church really teaches. Absolutely. And work through some of the ignorance. Let's take our next caller. This is uh, Carrie. Hello, Carrie. What's your question for us tonight? Uh, good evening, Marcus. Um, I was just wondering, Mr. Benton, uh, you seem to have encountered a lot of suffering through, like, the loss of your wife and et cetera. How do you relate this to suffering, how do you relate your suffering to unconditional love and God's grace? Well, that's what made me come to unconditional love. Uh, bad things are going to happen. Tragedy is going to happen. And what you have to look at is, if that were the only thing that was going to happen, then I would be devastated. But I know that there's more. There's another world. And our faith carries us forward. Our faith carries us to heaven and to the spiritual world that we're going to go to. Uh, you know, we can't live in the world we do and see the horror that goes on without coming to some sort of understanding that, uh, and, and that we're going to suffer. We have to know we're going to suffer. We have to give it meaning. And, and we have to give uh, the faith the chance to carry us through these tragedies. And, and, and it will. 
It'll carry you through the tragedies. But it's difficult. It's not easy. It's a terrible thing to have to go through. But all of us are going to go through it. And that's part of what Christ tried to tell us. And uh, the unconditional love is where it works. That's where you find out where the grace is. Yep, part of that unconditional love, of course, is knowing that, as God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. His love is, is not going to be depend on one minute or the next on how, right. how good or bad we are. And on top of that, so even in the midst of the most powerful suffering we can be experience, uh, God can be very, very close. Well, we've in seen that. these wonderful people that go through terrible tragedies and, and with great strength come through them inspirationally. Or they, just, they have their bodies virtually destroyed and they, they make lives yeah. out of themselves. How do the world they do that? Yeah. Well, they do it through God's grace. That's mm -hmm. why. And, and it's because of this tapping into this power that's available to us. We'll take this next email and, and I'll, I'll help you on this one. Mm -hmm. if, if, uh, she's, uh, this is from Dottie and she's asking a question about which is a good Bible for her to use. I'm an avid listener and watcher of the TV program. I plan to call the RSIA at one of our local Catholic churches soon, which means she's very interested in, in coming into the church. I would like to ask you to recommend a Bible. I see in our local bookstore that there seem to be several versions. Is there one that is usually used when you attend RCIA? Thank you so much for your program, Marcus. I can relate to so much of what your guests say, I now belong to the Episcopal Church. If there's anything else you would suggest reading at this time, we appreciate your input. Again, thank you, Dottie. You answer that one. All right. <laughs> I'm well, not the theologi theologian here, you know. <laughs> well, let me say that there, as far as I know, there's no official Bible for RCIA. You might check at the parish what particular uh, Bible they're using. There's a couple uh, good ones that are, of course, recommended by the church, uh, one being the Revised Standard Edition Catholic, uh, rise, uh, Standard Version Catholic Edition, which is a very uh, reliable and uh, a good text for studying the scriptures. And uh, the other would be the New American Standard. So those are both available at your local Catholic bookstore. She also asked, asked for what other books might be helpful to her as an Anglican. And uh, I strongly recommend some of the conversion stories that are now being published of those who've made the journey because not only are they easy to read, they're very personable, they also will have the apologetics, deal with the doctrines coming in, books like Surprised by Truth or um, the Hans book on Rome Sweet Home, or maybe a, a, a fiction like yours, Uncle Jeb and the Spirit, which again tells the conversion process and gives some of the, the issues that will help her in her journey. Let's take the next caller. From Anthony, what's your question for us tonight? Uh, hey, Marcus. Hello. Uh, my question is for Mr. Benton is uh, if he could give some ideas on how a layperson could balance their busy life with uh, wanting to evangelize. Well, what, what I do... Sound familiar. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I tell you the truth. Um, much of my work is, is like I'm in, I'm in the, the right to life work. I, I've recently uh, authored uh, a a, a bill that, that defined viability, which when I found out, you know, that you have Roe versus Wade says a woman has a right to abortion until viability, and I found that, that there was no real definition after that, and that the, the, the Supreme Court had given the state's rights to draw that line. It used to be trimester, and they said, no, you can mm -hmm. make it, uh, but something tied in with health care, and nobody had done it. And so, to me, doing that work is the way to evangelize. We Catholics are out there fighting for the life of these babies. And, and my, uh, my Protestant friends that are in the fight know we're out there in the front lines. We're leading the fight. Mm -hmm. you, you evangelize by the way you live. You evangelize by your Christian charity. You, you evangelize by the way you love them unconditionally. Uh, the idea of sitting down and having debates and, 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 and turn them uh, into Catholics that way I don't think is... Uh, is the way to do it. I think it's, you have to do it by example, you have to do it by activity with them, you have to do it by showing that you're a decent person, you don't cheat, you don't, you know, go to commit confession one day and go out and lie the next, <laughs> you know, uh -uh. and misuse your own sacraments. It's, it's how you live and try to be decent. It's hard to do and not get rid of your anger. Can you control your anger, you know? When you were in your journey into the church, from Methodism, of course, you'd also describe that even though you were brought up in the Methodist Church, it, what had been up here in your head hadn't really gotten down to here. That's right. That's right. But in your journey into the Catholic Church, you obviously had to deal with doctrines, you know, examining different things. If you look back on your journey, for you, what was the most difficult of the Catholic doctrines? 
to deal with in your well, I, once I got through the sacraments, uh, you know, and had the explanations that I, that I could accept logically, because, you know, my name is Thomas, the doubter, you know. <laughs> And uh, I defend the church to different Catholics, uh, I mean, that were leaving. I said, don't leave now. My God, you've got this wonderful church. And, and it's, you know, we have a, my parish has uh, 2,000 families in it. And that means 6,000 people counting babies. We have one pastor. Mm-hmm. We have 50 programs. Who's running it? The Protestant? No, I mean, the, 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 the parents, the, the members. We have a school. That's what God wants in the church. He wants all the Catholics to get out there spiritual bottoms and start doing something for themselves now, you know, and, and get active in the church and, and take over and not, not leave it. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's we're God is still running this church and we're going to get our priests and nuns back. But in the meantime, we have to wake up to the fact that we have to use the church. We're supposed to be using the church. We're supposed to be uh, participating in, in all this, the good works that we're doing. John Paul. Uh, released a wonderful document on the work of the laity, called Christopher Dallas Laici. Sadly, I th- many laity have never read this wonderful document on the work of the lay people in the church, and I strongly encourage you to, it basically says what you've said, and that is we laity need to understand their calling in the church, and uh, where, where, what our work is, and uh, that we're on the front lines, as you were as an attorney. In fact, here's an email which kind of touches on your work as an attorney, Mr. Benton, as an attorney, have you been able to witness to your faith and God's unconditional love in your work? We face so many anti-Catholic and anti-family attacks today. You must be challenged as a lawyer who loves God. I appreciate any comments. And since John Paul here, I wonder. No, it's probably just someone called John Paul. I bet the Pope didn't send this particular <laughs> email to. Well, you know, as a lawyer, and I, and I have trial work, and uh, people hire lawyers because they're mad, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, a business, if it's business, it's okay, but if they're going to get into fights, and, and it's, uh, I, I teach young lawyers, they have exactly five seconds to be honest. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody comes in, you know it's right and wrong. You didn't have to go to law school to learn that. You know, you know it's right and wrong. If it's wrong, don't do it. Just don't do it. Right. And if you've got people who, uh, that have revenge on their minds, then I tell them, I said, you want revenge? I'm not in the revenge business. I'm not in the business of taking on cases to hurt somebody, you know. Mm-hmm. Now, if you've got these differences with a lot of anger, then you, you have to live with it. But you try and get rid of the anger. And then, of course, you as an individual have to go through the purifying process of getting rid of the anger every day. Because if you don't, you know, this, this is the, the thing that blocks grace as much as anything. You know, Christ said, you're going to be judged as you judge. You're going to be forgiven as you forgive. Four or five times in the Bible. It's, it's scary. You know, mm-hmm. this is scary. We're writing our own sentence, mm-hmm. you know. And if I can't get over my, my anger, if I can't get over, and I, I get mad, man, I can get mad. So <laughs> ten, 10 seconds and I'm mad. So we, we are, we've, we've got to do that because it kills it. It kills your marriage. It kills your children's relationship. It kills your, everybody, everything. It takes, because it turns off grace. Grace well, just goes out of your let's, life. Let's go on with that a bit because you'd mentioned earlier in discussions that you felt that one of the main things that separate people from God and from the church is anger. That's because grace gets shut off. It's kind of like turn off a light. I, I, I like to draw the analogy of, of God is a sun and we're in this room with a window. When we get mad, we draw the curtain over the window huh. and the light doesn't come in anymore. We did it, see? We yeah. cursed the document, but we did it. The light's still there. The light's out there, but we, we cut it off. Yeah. And uh, if you can't forgive, now you don't have to like the people, you don't have to spend time to them, but you can't sit up there and think of revenge and uh, uh. And, and I also have kind of a, another technique, I say, you don't have the privilege of upsetting me. You know? <laughs> you know, if you're trying to hurt my feelings, I'm sorry, but only my wife and my children have that privilege. Huh. And not all the time, either them. You, know? I said, there's the, you, have to, you have to get to the point where I'm not going to let this upset me, and you have to set your mind in advance, because I know it's going to happen. Hmm. I'm going to lose whatever grace I've got in my life at that time, which turns off, because there's some things we can't do without God, constantly with us, you know, like the garden. We have to have his presence. And if we turn out his presence, then we, we simply don't, it doesn't go right. See. We have one last email. Here we got a little time. Uh, this is from Ann. I've had to work with many committed non-Catholic Christians in my work. Ideally, I would love to convert them all. However, in everyday struggles for pro-life and family issues, I find them to be great allies. Can you comment on how we can work t- 
together in such ways? So working ecumenically, especially in the pro-life areas. Well, as an ecumenical author of an ec uh, co-author of an ecumenical manual, I'll tell you the three things that you do if, when you're going to sit down ecumenically with your Christian friends, and I've done this very effectively. <coughs> uh, I, I was at a, a Presbyterian deacons meeting, as a matter of fact. My daughter is, a, out of my children, I have nine Catholics and one very good Presbyterian and her husband, wonderful people. And I was invited to their deacons meeting and my daughter was afraid I'd say something. I did. <laughs> when they asked me to stand up and I said, I bring you greetings from the Pope. <laughs> Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that he was crucified, died, and resurrected? Do you believe in the Trinity, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Everybody say yes. Welcome, brother. You're not the enemy. The enemy's out there killing us. The people who are making a state religion that, that Every time you say God, they say separation of church and state, and so they, they put their religion in, you see, which is a religion in itself, a type of atheistic religion. So what you have to do is say, welcome, welcome. We are Christians together. Let's love together. Let's go forward together. I'm not going to, but I want those litmus tests meet because those are yeah. hard. That's a hard test, see. Yeah. And if they can't do that, then say, well. Yeah, well, this is the mystery. In fact, I would encourage those that, that have uh, other questions about that particular issue is to look, I think, in the, in the catechism, I forget what the numbers of the text are because we don't have time to look it up, but it talks about the reality of those that are outside the church that are saved through their faith, through their baptism, because of the church. Even if they're outside, they're saved as a part of the church. And, but it also talks about the reality of those that know, in fact, that the church is the church of Christ. The Catholic Church is the church founded, that they have responsibility to come home. So there's that great... Um, fine line there that's explained very well in the catechism. Tom, it's been a wonderful joy having you on the program. Thank you for not only being with us, but for your book. Look forward to that and encourage it to others. And uh, thank you for your witness. And I also ask God's blessing on your continued pro-life work. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Please stay with us. We'll be back just a moment for some closing thoughts for the journey home. Welcome back to the journey home. Just a couple of things to uh, just tie up some loose ends. I mentioned earlier about some paragraphs in the catechism, and I would give you those numbers for your own study afterwards. Uh, if you turn to paragraphs 166 and following, you'll find where the catechism deals with the, the creed, especially the section of we believe, and it talks about the beliefs of Catholics. And then also beginning on chap uh, paragraph 846, salvation outside the church, and the, the meaning of being united with the church. The following paragraphs will deal with that clearly. Our topic for tonight, as Thomas described his journey, had to do with unconditional love. And it reminds us that conversion itself is a gift, a gift of God's love into our hearts. Sometimes it's our hearts that are the hardened and therefore become a barrier to what God desires to give us. So it involves us being open, uh, as Christ called heaven, softened or open hearts. But even that, the ability to open our hearts is a gift of God's grace. So all of this begins with prayer. Prayer, asking the Lord to soften our hearts, uh, making our hearts ready, as we read in one of the Psalms for today's Mass, or that someone else's heart would be ready. Some of the questions about conversions of others. You never want to give up praying for others, that their hearts might be open and ready to receive the gift of God's unconditional love. When we think about love, there's no more well-known passage in Scripture than that of 1 Corinthians 13. Many of us heard this at, have heard this read at weddings, but do we listen to what it says? Let me read in closing this program and think of this is the kind of love not only that God has given us, but that we are to give. It begins in verse 4. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, 
hopes all things, endures all things, and love never ends. And then at the end of that chapter, so faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. It began with God's gift to us in love and creation. Continue with God's gift to us in His Son with love. And then the love that is birthed in our hearts through His grace continues when we reach out in unconditional love to others. Let's pray that we have that gift of love, that our hearts aren't hardened, but that we'll be open to sharing that love. Because as I've often said, we're on this journey together. We walk alone, sharing God's love. God bless. I'll see you next week.